Hi, everyone. How are y'all? Let me know if you can hear me. I just realized I don't have the mic set up right. So hold on. Let me fix it. And boom. Okay, wrong fancy mic now. Perfect. How are y'all doing? Happy Wednesday. Usually our live is on Thursday, but I will be out of town tomorrow. Going home to check on my family. My cousin's having her bachelorette party, so that should be fun. So I figured we would have our live today, and this topic is something we talked about on Instagram a couple weeks ago, and so I figured we would make this our live because it's very fascinating. And as most Black women born any time... <laughs> after 1970. I have had a perm. I've had a many a perm as a young kid. A relaxer, if you may, the technical term, a perm. And still have the scar from my first perm, which is in the corner of my forehead. Um, you can't see it because I have makeup on right now. So yes, let us get into it. Thank you. I appreciate y'all. Thank you, Marsha. All right. So let's go ahead and get into it. I feel like I was supposed to tell y'all something else. But I can't remember for the life of me. You know when you're supposed to go on a trip and you're like, oh, I didn't pack. I didn't do these things. But yeah, that's me. I washed the clothes, though. So step one. Step one. My flight is stupidly early in the morning as well. So this is going to be great. <laughs> this is going to be great. All right. Let's hop into it. Okay. So. I had to use my favorite girl, which is if you're familiar and if you're following me on Instagram, come join on Instagram. We have like little chats. We had a we restarted Money Mondays, which are little finance topics um, this past Monday, which was a lot of fun. And on Instagram, I use this picture because when I was a kid, I was obsessed with this little girl and this bang. I wanted this bang. And when I got my hair permed and I finally got a bang, honey, it didn't look like that. It didn't look like that because most likely, as the girls admitted on Twitter, um, her hair is probably not permed. Yes, which we will get into that as well. But me and this little girl um, from Just For Me, I was like, oh, I want a bang just like this, just like this. So we are going to work a little bit backwards with this lawsuit. We're going to start with the Crown Act, specifically because I think in talking about hair relaxers, perms, as they're colloquially known. A perm, because I know that YouTube is always mixed company, but this topic is very much for Black women. And I would say some brown women as well, but mostly for Black women. Um, in terms of a relaxer, a relaxer straightens your natural curly hair. And a perm, if you were to buy it in the store, is to make your hair curly. However, colloquially, colloquially Black people just call it a perm. So interchangeably, I'm going to use them. I'm probably just going to say perm. So we'll just start with that. So we're going to start backwards with the Crown Act to talk about the why. Why have we been perming our hair all these years? And why did our mom perm our hair? Why did our grandma perm our hair? All these things. So I think working backwards really sets the tone that we live in a society, a society with issues, a society with forced assimilation, which is why um, when nappy didn't make white people happy, our mothers permed our hair. And that caused a lot of issues, particularly health issues. So we'll get into a bit of history afterwards um, in the complaint, and then specifically the health issues that um, overwhelmingly affect Black women and that have been linked to perms, to hair relaxers. All right. And then we'll get into the 15 claims. Yes. the fi Listen, this was the box. Every time this box came up, I was like, oh, my God, here we go. Every time my mom put it in the cart. When she went to Sally's, I was like, oh, which I grew up with my dad, but I spent the first 11 years um, living with both my parents so they got divorced. And then eventually with my dad, I lived with my mom, she did perm my hair. So I got my first perm. I want to say the first grade. It's the first or second grade. I think it's the first grade. I did ask my dad to send me a picture. You know, listen, he tried. <laughs> he tried. I don't know why the picture looks the way it does. So the picture is not in here. I was like, oh, okay. Never mind this. Never mind this. So let's start with the Crown Act. All right. So the Crown Act, let me make this a little big, stands for creating a respectful and open world for natural hair. It is a U.S. law which essentially prohibits race-based hair discrimination, which is the denial of employment and educational opportunities because of hair texture or protective hairstyles, including braids, locks, twists, or Bantu knots. So the Crown Act has been passed in, we're almost to half of the states. So you can see right here, everything in dark blue, those are the states where the Crown Act is currently the law. So California, New York, Louisiana, um, Tennessee, 
Illinois. And then you have the purple states where it has been introduced. So it's not necessarily the law yet. And then where you see the blue dots, those are specific counties or cities that have passed the Crown Act. Now, why do we need the Crown Act? Because we were facing discrimination. That's the only reason why laws come into place because people realize, oh yeah, this awful thing is happening to this group. Okay, we need a law to protect against that. All right, and if you live in any of these states that are mostly in the magenta purple area, maybe you might live in one of these counties or cities. So specifically some counties to call out, Raleigh, Greensboro, Winston-Salem, so Piedmont Triad, uh, Triad area over in North Carolina has the Crown Act, Shreveport, Louisiana has the Crown Act, Broward County, Florida, shout out to Broward County. Um, I think it's interesting, Broward County is on this list, but not Miami-Dade which makes sense because Miami-Dade has lots of anti-blackness. Um, we have Tempe, Arizona, Tucson, Arizona in here, Morgantown, West Virginia, Louisburg, West Virginia, Charleston, West Virginia, lots of cities in West Virginia, um, which, is, which is awesome. Some places in Kentucky as well, and then a few places over in Georgia. And most of the places where you see that are places with um, large populations of black people and particularly people that have been able to get the legislature passed. I think it's fascinating that Texas has a lot of black people and still Texas is pending. It's interesting. I'm sure um, Greg Abbott amongst the many evil things he probably doesn't like natural hair either. All right so why this is important and how this all comes about is from one main thing and everything else branches from this which is assimilation. When you come into the United States, the United States mostly back in the day, and still today, nappy doesn't make a lot of people happy. Assimilation in anthropology and sociology is basically the process of which minority groups are forced to assimilate, to mesh into, to let go of their cultural customs, to then take on the cultural norms, the look, the feel, etc., of the majority group. And the reason why that is done by the minority groups is often because if you don't assimilate, you do not receive the benefits of the society that you have been forced into. Which, of course, with chattel slavery, of course, how could this not come up? And also in terms of one of the main drivers, which we're going to get into statistics as well, as to why people assimilate even now. Because one of the things why we're doing this a little bit backwards and having this discussion, even though now we know Unequivocally, yes, perm is harmful. Perm may cause certain things. Perm is very bad for your health. People are perming their hair because having straightened hair, you're more likely to get the job. Having straightened hair, people are more likely to treat you with maybe a modicum of kindness or respect versus if your hair is natural. Having certain textured hair, if we're going to get into um, the hierarchy of texturism, people are, to, are more likely to treat you with a level of decency and respect, and that is due to assimilation. And assimilation, I don't care anybody says, is an awful thing. Now, this is the first video on the um, channel. And if a, bit, a brief history of this channel, this channel technically is two years old that I've been posting on this channel. The channel itself, though, started in 2017. My best friend and I, when I wanted to try out producing something, I roped her into making a video with me. So this is Shayna, my best friend. We've been best friends for shit, almost 12 years now. She also has natural hair, as you can see. You can see my fried ass hair in this video. This is 2017. So the first video on this channel and the only video we ever made together and years ago was a video about wearing your natural hair at work. So I figured we'd play it a little um, trip down memory lane and also some assimilation in real time and some admissions on my end about assimilating into um, corporate work culture. All right, let me remove me. All of my internships. And I was straightening my hair and caused heat damage and never wore my hair curly. Yeah, I really started to wear it natural more so when I started working here in New York. I sort of got into more of a creative industry, which I guess for me left it a little bit more open, you know? <laughs> so, you know, they like the fro. They like the fro now. They like it now. <laughs> Whereas I have always been on the corporate side, a little less fro friendly. So, for example, <laughs> at um, my last job, Wore bone straight on my interview. It's very polite, you know. Hi, I'm Stephanie. My hair is straight. <laughs> it is not that. And probably the <laughs> And then by month three, I was like, listen, I got a lot of heat damage. I'm about to wear this curly. 
And I literally walked into my boss's office the next day. She's like, oh, hey, good morning, girl. And she was like, <laughs> oh, good morning, girl. <laughs> All right. Hold on, let me unmute you. First of all, this is 2017. So this is five years ago. You see how damaged my hair is? The hair looks completely different. And that's because even though I was natural, I went natural in the seventh grade. So I went to live with my dad and my dad let me. And I was like, okay, cool. Who wants to get their head burned? Oh, like it's painful. Getting a perm is painful. So the chance I got to be like, I don't have to go. I was like, great. But that then started my um, very codependent life with the flat iron and the heat comb and the hot comb. So my hair is very much fried there. And all of my corporate life, my hair was fried till maybe I would say like, two-ish maybe three years ago I finally was like I'm not about to straighten my hair all the time for y'all why the minute it's humid then it frizzes out then you ask me all these questions you're gonna ask me all these questions anyway I don't want to do it so I stopped doing it but it took a long time it took a long time and to know because I saw people um saying same in the Caribbean as well as talking about Nigeria as well I think that is a great point so to bring that in the Caribbean we are colonized as well as Nigeria, South Africa, Kenya, all of the continent except for Ethiopia has been colonized by Europe and due to colonization have been forced into certain practice, certain um, European beauty standards. So you do see the same adhering to, oh, we have to perm our hair. We have to do these things because who was running the country for so many years? So I think that's important to put that in there. All right, so let's go ahead and get into the next part. Boop, boop, boop. Oh, if my internet wants to work. So these were some statistics. So Dove did a study. Dove has been the corporate sponsor for the Crown Act and getting the Crown Act passed. Um, passed. So Dove did a study, and in their study, they found Black women are 1.5 times more likely to be sent home from the workplace because of their hair, and then Black women are 89% more likely than white women to agree with the statement, I have to change my hair from its natural state to fit in at the office. The minute your hair is in any type of natural state in a mostly white office is the minute everybody, for some reason, is very distracted in the meeting. It's very distracted. They have lots of questions. They want to touch the amount of people that when I first tried to um, wear my hair natural, that just, re and I was like, what are you doing? What's happening? What's going on over there? Don't do that. That's called assault. Touching people without permission is assault. Asking someone to touch their hair is very strange. It's very weirdo behavior. Don't do that. Why? Hair is dirty. It's dead skin cells. It's very strange. I always tell people that. And then into that, the reasons for Black women's use and dependence upon hair straightening products are associated with various factors, including one, slavery and internalizations of acceptable beauty norms and what was termed in this country as well as the Caribbean and as well as throughout parts of Africa, um, acceptable beauty norms are European beauty norms, which European hair is largely and overwhelmingly very straight and much thinner than our hair. It's, it's different. Media and advertisements, assimilation and economic security. People would not be perming their hair at such rates if it wasn't directly tied to the fact that, well, I have to eat. So the only way to eat in this place is I have to go to work. And if I'm going to get denied from all these interviews, well, then I guess I'm going to straighten my hair. And that was largely one of the reasons why I kept straightening my hair until I had enough. But by the time I started going to interviews, I didn't do it till like three years ago, um, going to interviews with my hair curly, to be quite frank, the natural hair movement on YouTube and overwhelmingly in the U.S. definitely helped with that because then people were at least used to seeing natural hair and texturism came into play. People were used to seeing a certain type of natural hair. People were like, OK, I don't love it, but... I've seen this and this is acceptable to me. The way Shayna got treated with her 4C hair and the way I've gotten treated with my 3C hair is apples and oranges, depending on the company. When she worked in a creative field um, at, at agencies, they didn't seem to care. But in corporate offices, it's been very different. And that should be noted as well. And that actually comes up in the complaint. So there's that. And then there's ease of hair maintenance and culture. We have often and sadly perpetuated having permed hair in our own culture as well. Y'all know I cannot see this. Hold on. All right. So on that note, in terms of the study that Dove conducted in a culture where Black women feel reduced, and this is from the complaint, 
reduced to lower standard of beauty, these factors impact women of color's decisions to begin and continue using products to alter the natural state of their hair many times as a protective mechanism against racial discrimination. In the Dove Crown Study for Girls, which was conducted in 2021, um, the below statistics were discovered 100%, so every single little black girl they interviewed, of black elementary school girls in majority white schools who report experiencing hair discrimination state they experience the discrimination by the age of 10. By 10 years old, little black girls are told, listen, um, that's not going to work. That's not going to work for me. I don't like it. Don't do that. Why does it look like that? Why is the biggest question I used to get in the second grade when we used to run around and play soccer and it used to be in a ponytail was, Stephanie, why is your hair fuzzy? Why is the top of it fuzzy? And I was like, girl, it's humid. It's humid outside. Like, didn't we learn about precipitation in class? Why are you asking me this? This is silly. 86% of black teens who experience discrimination. Let me move me. There we go. Experience discrimination state they have experienced discrimination based on their hair by the age of 12. This makes me so sad. 53% of black mothers whose daughters have experienced hair discrimination say their daughters experience this discrimination as early as five years old. 47% of black mothers report having experienced discrimination related to their hair. Trauma from these experiences causes girls to miss days from school. Teenage black girls are missing a week of school per year due to hair dissatisfaction. And that dissatisfaction is rooted in forced assimilation, colonization, and discrimination. And I think it's important when we have this conversation, particularly as somebody that um, has a level of texture privilege as well, that we have the conversation that it's not, oh, you need to love your hair. You need to get over it. You, it's, it's, a, it's, not a, it's a systemic issue. If it is directly correlated to how people are gonna treat you, we are incentivized to straighten our hair. People are incentivized to straighten their hair. People are incentivized to get a job. People are incentivized to have not people bother them in school. It is better instead of to ask the people who are being victimized and the people who are being bothered, it is better to address the systemic issue and the people asking the full, full questions. Now, um, this is going to come up later when we talk about people who really don't understand and very much believe in personal responsibility. 90% of Black girls believe their hair is beautiful. The microaggressions and discrimination she endures has an impact on how she sees herself. So the issue is not how Black women view ourselves. The issue is how we are treated despite how we view ourselves. And I think that's important to focus on as we go um, through the complaint. All right. <laughs> Candice, this contributed to segregated beauty aisle products in stores like Walmart and CVS. You know, it's so um, interesting that you say that. I don't think I realized that, quote unquote, ethnic hair, our hair, was in a different aisle till I was a big grown woman. I was just so used to like, OK, I'm going down this aisle. <laughs> I'm going down my aisle where just for me and the Bayang are and where the Cantu is and I know where my stuff is. I was not even aware that there was a separate aisle for white beauty products which is very wild. All right, so let's go through our hair story. Okay, let me move me. All right, so a bit of statistics. Black people as a whole, both Black Americans and Black immigrants make up about 13% of the U.S. population. Um, but by one estimate, African Americans, which it's interchangeably saying Black and African Americans, so let's put that out there, spending accounts for as much as 22% of the $42 billion a year personal products market, suggesting that we buy and use more of such products, including those with potentially harmful ingredients, than Americans as a whole. And that is largely due to the fact that our hair is scrutinized much more. One of the things when I went to college that I was so like, oh, I want to try this hairstyle. This hairstyle is like, I could really rock this hair. This looks cute. And I never did it in college was a messy bun. White girls in college loved a messy bun. I was like, oh, this looks so easy. Like, okay, you can froof it up. To wear your natural hair in that way, the way people will look at you and the way people will act like, I'm just going to go outside like this? I was like, why? Well, Becky's outside like this? Like, why? We? This is my friend? Like, we could be outside like this together? It's like, no, absolutely not. We are spending more money on hair care largely because we are scrutinized for our hair. We can't walk around with messy bun. We can't do these things. And lately, every once in a while, I have been like, I don't care. 
I get on Instagram. If you go on my Instagram, I don't care. I'm like, I don't, I'm, but that I'm 31 years old. How many years of decolonizing my own mind to get there, to get to the point of like, oh, well, I'm just going to do what I want to do. It's not something that we are overwhelmingly given um, the ability to without people saying things. So in 2020, the global black hair care market was estimated at $2.5 billion with the hair relaxer market alone, and this is the perm, estimated at $718 million in 2021. And then let me remove me. Okay, here we go. With the expectation of growth to $854 million annually by 2028. There is this large misconception that now that we've had a very visible natural hair movement that everyone is going natural, and that is not true. And it is not true because the systems that have kept our hair permed have not changed. The Crown Act exists because people were realizing and looking at the statistics and saying, okay, whenever I have locks in my hair, whenever my hair is in braids, whenever my hair is natural, I get treated this way and it is unfair. And it's taken now all the way to 2022 for this to be pushed forward in certain states. It is not a national law. Okay, African hairstyle. So a bit about the history, which I thought this was really um, one of the reasons that I think that this complaint is laid out very well, is that the complaint does a good job in tying the fact that if you are here in the US, um, and you are descended from people who were stolen from Africa, that's how you got here. We have a history outside of that. If you're in the Caribbean, it's the same thing. So it does a good job at showing like, hey, before we came to this place, we had a certain way that we did our hair before colonization, before, you know, Huna ruined everything. There was a means to, to deal with this, to do what we wanted to do. So I really like that. So it's talking about African hairstyles for a second. African hairstyles were also status symbols reflecting one's marital status, age, religion, and rank in society and one's tribe. Warriors, kings, and queens wore braids to show their ranking in society. The Wolof tribe in West Africa, um, which is now mostly in Senegal, so shout out to Senegal in the World Cup, were braided styles when they went to war. Most of the styling was extremely in intricate and involved days of labor. Everyone through everyone though engaged in this process as the, only the mad in the morning do not do their hair. According to their their um quote <laughs> that they pulled from the time, which I thought that was funny. I was like, you know what? We do love our hair. And in as early as 1786, what is often um, noted as the first anti-black, anti-black hair law in the United States, in 1978, the governor of Louisiana, Don Esteban Miro, passed the Tijnan laws, which I never know if I'm saying that right, requiring black women to wear a Tijnan, a scarf, over their hair as a way of signifying they were members of the slave class, even if they were free. So there were... I don't know if a lot is the right term, but there were a significant amount of free black people in Louisiana at the time, but everyone, every woman was forced to wear a scarf on her head. By requiring free black women to wear the same hair covering, the governor was marking them as related to enslaved women rather than white women. So the differentiation. And then it also went into the root of our texturism in this place is slaves with lighter skin and less coily hair were favored to work in the home, a far less strenuous position than in the plantation field. And yes, working in the house and working forcibly as an enslaved person was hard, was awful. You're likely subjected to um, rampant abuse. However, it was physically less taxing than working in the plantation field. This um, bore the idea of texturism, which texturism is alive and well today. Um, and is one of the reasons if you watch all those videos on why the natural hair movement failed, a large part of that is texturism and the girls with the three C claiming that if you use these three products that the hair was magically gonna do that, acting a plum fool and conning other people, to be quite frank. Texturism, the idea that good hair is equated with a straighter hair texture was cemented into American culture during this period of chattel slavery. Eurocentric beauty standards um, were the cause of this. So the way humans operate and the way humans have operated, if I notice, I'll get better treatment. I will not have to be outside. I will not have to do these things if my hair looks a certain way, if I look a certain way. Of course, people who are forced into this awful form of life, then we're like, okay, well, let me try to figure it out because who wants to deal with all the things that come along with chattel slavery? 
which inserts the trifling trifecta of texturism, colorism, and featureism. These things have been along the whole time. They have been here a long, long time. So European um, standards dictated, let me make this a little bit bigger, dictated that coily hair and dark skin were unattractive and inferior, lighter skin and straightened haired slaves and slave people were favored and selected for more desirable positions in the house as opposed to the field. Thus, the texture of an enslaved person's hair could determine their value and working conditions, which in turn might impact their overall health, comfort, and chances of freedom. You have a higher likelihood of freedom if, I don't even, if the enslaver had a moment of sanity and decided to let you go. I mean, did they really let anybody go? I, that's debatable. I don't really believe in that. Most people beg, borrowed, and steal for their freedom, but we're not going to get into that right now. Naturally, Black men and women strive for a better life in the Americas and were taught that the straighter and less kinky their hair was, the better a life they could have. This fueled the desire for tools and products that could straighten Black hair textures. So this is the root of it. The root of most of the problems in this country are this, but you know, people, people don't want to talk about that. People don't want to say that. So I thought this was interesting in terms of keeping in with history that the hot comb was actually invented by this French man. He invented the hot comb. So people will use the hot comb and we're like, okay, um, we have this. It was then modified by Madam C.J. Walker um, to account for thicker hair as well. Madam C.J. Walker, who original name, what was her name? Sarah Breedlove. I think Madam C.J. Walker's name was Sarah Breedlove, if I remember correctly. Um, she is basically the mother of black hair. She did not invent the relaxer, just to put that out there. She, some of her products had to do with growing your hair longer because again, the closer you are to European beauty standards, the more likely people will treat you with a modicum of decency. This is all about getting treated in an equitable manner. And then the person that made the precursor to um, the modern relaxer was this man. His last name was Morgan, which hold on, I wrote out his full name. One second. Garrett Augustus Morgan. He was a black American man. He was an inventor and a tailor. He first used this chemical. He was, um, since he was a tailor, to basically smooth out curly textures in clothing. And he realized like, oh, this works. He then tried it on his dog. And then he tried it on himself. That's a lot. He then, because he realized he could make money and he realized, oh, well, I'll have a better life. We will all have a better life if our hair is a little bit straighter. He started selling it. However, the first what we call and what we know as a relaxer with the products and the chemicals that have ruined our hair um, came about in 1971 by Dark and Lovely. All right. I'm catching up with the comments real quick. <laughs> All right. Yes, Simone. She invented the Miracle Hair Girl after looking at how the black middle class quaffed their hair. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Okay, so Dark and Lovely, which Dark and Lovely is one of the defendants, and we're going to go through all of the brands because some of these brands, most people don't. I never associate L'Oreal with a relaxer. Dark and Lovely, yes. Just for me, yes. Um, Soft Sheen Carson, yes. Some of these brands own the actual, some of these companies own the actual brands that we're familiar with. So we're going to go through them at, at the end. One of them is Dark and Lovely. So Dark and Lovely created what we know to be the formula of a relaxer in 1971. Consisted of these things that should probably never go in our hair. Sodium hydroxide, water, fine. Petroleum jelly, mineral oils, and emulsifiers. In the 1970s, lye relaxer users and manufacturers noticed that the formula stripped proteins from the hair strand, resulting in the hair thinning and breaking. As a result, Johnson & Johnson marketed the first quote-unquote gentle hair relaxer in 1981, which used milder chemicals such as potassium hydroxide and lithium hydroxide. The fact that these are um, more gentle, but they have hydroxide in them, is all you need to know about why we should stop putting this in our head. Over time, Soft and Beautiful. So Soft and Beautiful is the parent owner of Just For Me. So all the girls that had Just For Me, that's where we got it from. And other chemical manufacturers developed 
herbal and botanical hair relaxer formulas. Today, the defendants market their hair relaxer products to African-American customers across the United States, the world, reinforcing the same historical Eurocentric standards of beauty. Defendants marketing scheme relies heavily on branding and slogans that reinforce straight hair as the standard. So here are the brands. So in case you're wondering who, who did it, is them. L'Oreal Inc., L'Oreal USA Products, Strength of Nature Global, Soft Sheen Carson, um, DeBurr International LTD, DeBurr USA Inc., and Namaste Laboratories. Namaste. There is nothing calm about your head burning with the relaxer. And here are some of the brands. So Motions, Salon Hair Care. Y'all remember, um, whenever I see Motions, I think of pink lotion, even though they're not related. <laughs> pink lotion never worked in my head. Dark and Lovely, Olive Oil, which Olive Oil, I think I used to use like their spray. And the one that got us all in the 90s, which was Just For Me. Just For Me brand specifically targets young Black girls with promises of perfect straightness, grooming the next generation of lifetime consumers of relaxers containing DEHP. DHP is one of the harsh chemicals. Listen, namaste those burns. <laughs> ay, ay, ay. Ay, ay, ay. In the 1990s, the first relaxer products for young girls, just for me, hit the market with a catchy advertising jingle. I don't remember the, I don't remember the ad. I remember the boxes though. It soon became one of the most popular straightening treatments, touting a no life formula designed to be gentle for children's sensitive scalps. It was not gentle. It was not. And Miss Mitchell, who is the woman suing, was first exposed to these chemicals, um, I'm going to say this wrong, so hopefully it's not too wrong. Folate-based Fall, products, which is the issue around 2000 at or around age 10. And I think that's what's important to be noted. Most people and most women that have used Relaxer didn't all of a sudden as an adult make the decision to use Relaxer. Relaxer was forced on us when we were kids. And then the irony of it all is a couple months ago on Twitter, the girls that were on the Just For Me boxes came out showing their lovely natural hair, reminding everyone, oh yeah, by the way, we've been natural all this time, all these years. Y'all wanted that thick bang. That bang was never permed. It makes 100% sense, but the girls in the relaxer boxes revealing they actually had unrelaxed hair that was just pressed or mousse for the photos has spun me. Which these are some of the girls. Hold on which you see they have grown up to be quite lovely and their hair is still looking good and relaxer has never seen it, has never seen it. So add false advertising to the list that the brands did. So Princess Nature um, with olive oil as well. Hair is giving healthy and unbothered. And my favorite girl here with the bang, I'm sure I didn't see anybody claim that it, they were her, but I'm sure that bang is also not relaxed either. Now that I know what I know, I'm like, ain't no relaxer that big. Um, to which one Twitter user commented, oh, what the computer said. Little black girls should be entitled to compensation because the relaxer box girls just told us their hair was never relaxed, just pressed. Which this man and called, who's called Bald William Dent, act right, <laughs> heifers. Anyways, I'm done with William. Bald, keyword on the bald, he has no hair, decided to state, Ask your mamas for compensation. The company didn't force you to their products. They sold a dream and you bought it. If you're mad at anyone, it should be the parents who put it in your hair, telling you you had to have straight hair to be more beautiful. And this is why we're not going to get free. And to William, who's not actually William Dent, to remind them 90% of black girls and their parents, most likely, believe their hair is beautiful. The microaggressions and the discrimination and that we have to endure have an impact on how we see ourselves. People like to exist to think sometimes that we exist in a bubble. People make their decisions by themselves. No, people make their decisions based on the society and the structures you live in. If we are financially incentivized to straighten the hair, yes. If everyone will leave me alone at school, if I will actually get to go to school, people have literally been pulled out of school for wearing their natural hair. We have seen it every other year it pops up. It happened in South Africa. They didn't want to let the little girl into the school because she was wearing her natural hair. South Africa, which is a predominantly black country run by who? 
people who have colonized the country. Just to put that out there. It is silly to tell people, this is your fault. You stop putting it in your hair without addressing the fact that we're only putting it in our hair in the first place because of systemic issues around us. Fixing the system would be much faster than blaming everybody individually. Listen, <laughs> he needs to mind his business, sticking his business where it doesn't belong. All right. So these are also some of the brands that sold hair relaxers and are being sued. Motions, Dark and Lovely, Olive Oil Relaxer, Organic Root Stimulator. All right. So on to why this is so important, not just because of the damage it causes to your hair. It is because it's a huge health issue. The reason why Miss Mitchell is suing is because, unfortunately, she has uterine cancer. So we are going to talk about the side effects of having perm in your hair. And it should be noted, people don't just perm their hair once and they're like, I'm never doing it again. Once you're on the creamy crack, you're likely on the creamy crack for a long time. Many years. I first or second grade all the way through seventh grade. And that's only because my dad was like, fine, you don't have to do it. And I was like, all right, cool. Great. Had he not said that, it would have been many more years till I was an adult and, was, and could have made the decision for myself. All right, so Miss Mitchell's uterine cancer, let me make me a little smaller. Uterine cancer was directly, so these are the allegations, was directly and proximately caused by her regular and prolonged exposure to phthalates. Child, hopefully I'm saying it somewhat right. And other endocrine disrupting chemicals found in defendants' hair care products. This, just to put a trigger on this. This is very, um, honestly, reading through this part of the complaint was very hard. It was very hard to read. And we'll, you'll see why in two seconds. So just a trigger warning y'all. All right. Relaxers are applied. So it also, one of the good things I really liked about the complaint in terms of the lawyering skills was the lawyer assumed rightfully, most likely the judge will not be familiar with hair relaxer. So they went through every single step of everything. And just, you know, if people aren't familiar with how this process of literally putting something that burns through your scalp onto your head works, we should read through this part. Relaxers are applied to the base of the hair shaft and left in place for a quote unquote cooking interval. It does feel like you're cooking, like your head is on fire, to which if you could complain, you will get popped with a wooden spoon. My mom was a wooden spoon lady. During which the relaxer alters the hair's texture by purposely damaging the hair's natural protein structure. The effect of this protein damage straightens and smooths the hair. After a period of four to eight weeks on average, I... I think I used to get mine every three months, four to eight weeks. Like, oh my God, that would have stressed me out. I do have some friends I know that they go bi-monthly, like clockwork, like clockwork. Depending on the hair's natural growth rate, the treated portion of the hair grows away from the scalp as new growth sprouts from the roots, requiring additional relaxer treatment to smooth the roots. These additional treatments are colloquially referred to in the community as retouches, resulting in women relaxing their new growth every four to eight weeks on average, usually four decades. It is the prolonged usage. A, the usage in the first place, but the prolonged uses of these awful chemicals directly onto your scalp that has correlated, according to numerous studies, to uterine cancer, breast cancer, fibroids, which we're going to go through. Hair relaxers can and often do cause burn and lesions. It's right there. And also, it's kind of like a dent in my head, which I don't know if I hit my head on something or, you know, maybe dipped into my skull a little bit. Who knows? I remember that thing scabbed up so thick. Mm. facilitating entry of hair relaxer constitutes in the body constituents into the body the main ingredient of lye relaxers is sodium hydroxide no lye relaxers contain calcium hydroxide and guanine carbamate and theo relaxers contain thiocolic acid salts none of these things sound like things that you'd want to put in your hair none of these things sound great now this came out when I think this came out before the lawsuit hit the news that chemical hair straightening linked to uterine cancer Cancer study warns black women. So these are the specific stats um, from that study. So specifically, since 
when you again get on the hair relaxer train is multiple times a year multiple times a year um, the study specifically and to note did not find that the relationship between straighteners and uterine cancer differed by race it warned though that the impacts may be greater for black women because of higher prevalence of use so with that this is the first study of this kind. Maybe if they were to do multiple, maybe they would say, hey, by race, it does differ. So that was one thing. But the study did track 33,497 women in the United States between the ages of 35 and 74. And they found that women who reported frequent use of hair straightening products, so these are specifically relaxer products, were more than twice as likely to develop uterine cancer compared with those who did not use the products. And this is just one of the health issues to know. There are numerous. So the odds are 1.64 um, women who have never used hair straighteners in the United States would go on to develop uterine cancer. But for frequent users, that risk goes up to 4.05. So it's more than doubling the rate. Hair products may contain hazardous chemicals with endocrine disrupting and carcinogenic properties, the report said. Previous studies have found hair products to be associated with a higher risk of hormone-sensitive cancers, including breast cancer and ovarian cancer. However, to our knowledge, no previous studies have investigated the relationship with uterine cancer. This is the first time to the knowledge of the Washington Post, as well as the medical facility that conducted the study, that they even bothered to look and see like, oh, you know what? Is this causing an issue? You know, this thing that we put on the market for 40 years? No, 1970? That's way more years. 1970, 30, 50 years, sorry. Y'all know math is not my ministry. I was like, I have to count this. All right. So one of the things, this is a product liability case, which we'll get into the claims at the end. There are 15 claims. That's a lot of claims. And rightfully so. We're not going to get into all of them, but we've I don't think we've ever covered product liability. So with product liability, one of the main things is you have to show, hey, I use the product like you said, or like you knew I would use the product. In this instance, she's using the product exactly like the box said. The box said, put it on your head, sit there, let it burn you, let it burn through your spirit, let it kill anything that um, is nappy in you. That's how she used the product, as it said. And in using the product like you told me to do, it has given me cancer. It is defective the way it is intended. So the lawsuit is also claiming that these companies knew and that there were safer alternatives and that also they did not do the testing that they should have done. So that's what's on the screen. There's no need for us to read through it, but put that up there. All right. Now, in terms of a little bit of medical knowledge for all of us, I think this is helpful. And also, I learned a lot of new things um, in reading through this lawsuit as well. So what the function of the endocrine system is, so I'm sure the doctors, lawyers, uh, the doctors, the nurses, um, all of the PT um, people, they are familiar with this. So for the rest of us that aren't in the medical field, the endocrine system is vital to maintain hormonal homeostasis, the body's natural hormonal production and degradation. A slight variation in hormone levels can lead to significant adverse health effects including reproductive impairment, infertility, cancer, cognitive deficits, immune disorders, and metabolic syndrome. Nothing good is coming out of this. What is the purpose of us being able to work in corporate? Because now we're finally in an appropriate state and we have assimilated if we're going to get these life-threatening diseases. Endocrine disrupting chemicals, so throughout the rest of the complaint, they just call them EDCs, are chemicals or chemical mixtures that interfere with normal activities of the endocrine system. Hair relaxers contain a lot of endocrine disrupting chemicals. Allegedly, according to this, and proven by numerous studies that are cited throughout this complaint. All right, so... One of the interesting things, if you were to look at the back of any of these hair relaxers, according to the complaint, is that it doesn't say life-threatening chemical in here. It says fragrance and perfumes, and that EDCs are present in the products as fragrances and perfumes. And I think that's particularly alarming when people now are more aware of, okay, let's try look for paraben-free, or which honestly, I need to look up, but I don't know what that means. I know that's a thing that people are doing. I haven't looked it up for myself up until now. I was like, oh, I should actually go see like what that is. Fragrance and perfumes, most people think are innocuous. As somebody who has eczema, I try to stay away from it, except for the Cantu. 
I like the smell of it, to be honest. But no one would think, oh, fragrances and perfumes means you're going to put something in my body that all of a sudden I am going to develop fibroids, breast cancer, ovarian cancer, all these things. And the complaint is asserting that that is not only disingenuous, it's dangerous and it's illegal. So indeed, numerous studies spanning more than two decades, so there have been a lot of studies on this, have demonstrated the adverse impact of the endocrine changing um, compounds, including... I don't know how to pronounce this. DI2 ethyl exyl phthalate. Something you do not want in your body. Something you don't want. Something, if you can't pronounce it, you probably don't want it. Have on the male and female reproductive systems, such as inducing endometriosis, abnormal reproductive tract formation, decreased sperm counts, and viability, pregnancy loss, and abnormal puberty onset. While we are focusing um, on women, there are men that straighten their hair. And that, you know, young jock, I remember when people, when it was a young woman went viral for the bang, and then when young jock straightened his hair, then someone made a little song and dance to his bang. There are men also straightening their hair. However, societally, it has been pushed onto black women for us to do it. So which is why it's more so focusing on black women, but the same effects are happening in men as well. So some of, just to just, you know, drive all of it home, some of the negative long-term impacts on the success of pregnancy, child growth and development, reproductive system in both young children and adolescents, several countries have established restrictions and regulations on some type of phthalates. And by several countries, they mean not the U.S. The U.S. has established some restrictions, but not in terms of the relaxer. He said, oh, yeah, these other sectors, y'all stop using that. But in terms of the relaxer, which predominantly is used by black women, the FDC has largely tur turned a blind eye. All right. Into the list of things that might be our Al Sharpton. Sorry. <laughs> y'all are silly. It is true. It is true. Into the list of things that, um, listen, the memes, I was going to put one in here and I was like, I shouldn't do that. But it was, I did chuckle. I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to lie that I did chuckle. That's happened from endocrine disrupting chemicals. And again, these are allegations in the complaint. However, in the complaint, it is using research backed medical research that states, oh yeah, for 20 years, we have known this will happen. Uterine cancer. This is the first time they've looked at the study for this. So uterine cancer. Second is breast cancer is associated with phthalate metabolites found in hair care products. And the stats on breast cancer are very alarming. Black women are more likely to develop breast cancer. Black women in health in this country is abysmal in terms of treatment from health care, in terms of prenatal health care, in terms of when you are giving birth. The horror stories Black women have been telling for years about how the health care system disregards us is astonishing. So it is no surprise that all these studies have been done and these companies are still selling this product. And we're going to do a video next month about black dads and health specifically um, since my dad had his accident. Um, it's something that has like been on my mind. So I think this will complement that conversation as well because it is very similar. So the use of straighteners in the years prior to baseline in this one study um, was associated with an 18%. 18% higher risk of breast cancer. And specifically, this is the Women's Circle of Health study, a case study of women in New York, use of relaxer before age 12 and between the ages of 13 and 19 years. This is almost all of us. Almost all of us, if you are the ages between, I would say like 25 and up. Almost all of us. If you are a kid of the 90s, trust me, your hair was most likely, well, not trust, you know, your hair is most likely straightened. And maybe that one day a year on picture day, you got to wear it straight with the bump on the end. And that was it. And for the rest of the year, it was up in braids. Oh, man. Sorry, I'll take a second. Breast cancer among African-American women, which is consistent with our findings of a suggestive higher risk for endocrine receptive tumors as well. In the Ghana breast health study, so this is across um, the diaspora as well, because it's not just a U.S. issue since European beauty standards due to colonization have been pushed on most of us. In the Ghana 
um, breast health study, use of relaxers was associated with a high risk overall and risk was elevated regardless of age of first use, including in the youngest age category, which is younger than 21 years old. Oh, goodness. Now I'm sitting here trying to calculate how many times have I got my hair permed. Lord. More recently, the National Institute of Health spent eight years, eight years studying this. And this is probably not the first time this information has come out, but this is the first time there has been enough coverage of the information in such a constructive way. And in a way that one person has said, no, this is ridiculous. Like I can't have children. Um, I have uterine cancer. Um, my life is in jeopardy. And y'all have been doing this my whole life. Since the age of 10, she's been getting a perm. Spent eight years studying over 46,000 women of all races between ages 35 to 74. They were looking for links between chemical hair relaxers and breast cancers. And they discovered African-Americans risk of breast cancer increased by 45%. They're very frightening statistics. Fibroids. So fibroids are um, essentially non-cancerous, usually, um, I think they're actually completely non-cancerous tumors, but they can cause great pain. And they can cause if they rupture um, very dire health consequences. So fibroids are not something like fun to have. A lot of women um, experience fibroids in the United States. However, as usual, black women um, are on the higher end and are actually three times more likely than our white counterparts to experience fibroids in our lifetime. A 2017 Rutgers study linked breast cancer and black women's use of hair relaxers. A 2012 study in the American Journal of Epidemiology associated fibroid risk with the use of hair relaxer. Okay, I'm just taking, <laughs> just trying to take a breath. I'm just trying to take a breath. Oh, goodness. Yes, Dana Marie, these kids do not be getting relaxers anymore. And I love that for them. I love that for them so much. I love that for them so much. Truly. All right. So this is from um, the University of Michigan. So understanding racial disparities for women with uterine fibroids. Black women are hit the hardest by fibroids, diagnosed roughly three times as frequently as white women, um, as I was saying. And... Nearly a quarter, so almost 25% of Black women between 18 and 30 have fibroids compared to 6% of white women. Fibroids are caused by numerous things. However, their studies have shown that hair relaxer is adding to that as well. According to some national estimates, by age 35, that number increases to 60%. So by 35, if you are a Black woman, you are more likely than not to have fibroids. And it is unpleasant, like I said. I've known a few people that have had it. You have to get them surgically removed. It is not, um, it is also something that is not talked about. So the people that I knew that had it, they were unaware for a while because when you receive awful care at healthcare providers, it doesn't really incentivize you to go to the doctor. So sometimes by the time you go, you haven't gone in a long time, which compounds the issue. Black women are also two to three times more likely to have recurring fibroids or suffer from complications. Now, in terms of why we are experiencing fibroids more than our white counterparts, um, most of the studies are unclear and offer that they need more data to better understand why Black women get fibroids more frequently and more severity. And to that, it's... It's disheartening for people to be like, I don't know what the problem is, but we need to do more data. So y'all need to do more research. Y'all need to do more research. Is it not as important that black women are suffering all these issues? And you're like, ah, you know, they're suffering, but <laughs> I can't focus on that right now. I gotta go focus on all these other people. Like, you know, they're, they're used to suffering. It's, it's fine. And it's just a little bit of setting. It's just a little bit of setting. J Dor, in my 50s and all of my girlfriends either have fibroids or have had a hysterectomy. The way we treated it in this place is an atrocity, atrocity. And the list is going on. Endometriosis. Endometriosis is associated with phallic metabolites. 
I think I said that one right, found in hair care products in black women in the USA, endometriosis is one of the common indications for major gynecological surgery and hysterectomy. So similar to what Jay Dior was saying, and is associated with long hospital stay and high hospital charges, which is important because as a systemically disenfranchised group, who is paying this hospital fee in a country where we pay all these taxes and we don't have um, universal health care? Endometriosis is a painful estrogen dependent disease resulting from the growth of the endometrial glands and stroma outside the uterus that causes a chronic inflammatory reaction. None of these things are things that should be lightly brushed off, but largely because black women are not believed when we say like, hey, I'm in pain. There are numerous studies that show that doctors are less likely to believe black women when they're in pain, which is why the mortality rate of black women giving birth is so high in this country and is higher than some quote unquote third world countries. Now to the claims. I'm sorry, this was very depressing, but it's very good information to know in terms of how to have this conversation with people in your life that are like, listen, I work in corporate, I work at the bank, I have to straighten my hair, I have to do these things. It's not worth your life. It's not worth your life. And also on the bigger issue of it is how do we rally behind the Crown Act and how do we change the system in place? Because if the system in place doesn't change, then people are going to keep straightening their hair. If people aren't able to make a living for themselves, be treated with dignity and respect, they will obviously, of course, keep straightening their hair. So there are 15 claims in this. We're not going to talk about all of them because that will be so long, but we're going to talk about a couple of them. So count one is strict liability, failure to warn. Count two, strict liability, design and manufacturing defect. Count three, strict liability, design and or manufacturing defect. So what the hell does that mean? So strict liability is a product liability. So product liability is a subsection of tort law, civil law. So anything that you are injured for, you can sue civilly. So products liability, as the name suggests, have to do with anything that you buy from a company. So strict liability is considered um, when it doesn't matter if the defendant, the company says like, oh, you know, that wasn't my intention to, you know, burn y'all's head. My intention was only to burn y'all's head. But my intention wasn't to give you cancer. It doesn't matter what the intention is as long as you show, hey, this is defective. This is causing issues. It's a strict liability case. You automatically will get um, the monies you're seeking, the um, restitution. So that's how strict liability works. In terms of product liability, the defenses usually are the risk utility test, which is why throughout the complaint, they state numerous times, hey, this is not a life-saving procedure you're giving people. There's no reason why you couldn't use the safer products. There's no reason you've known for years that there's all these things that you continue down this path just to make money. So the risk utility test, the defendant um, would use this, is not liable for design defect if evidence shows that the product's utility outweighs its inherent risk of harm. <coughs> Having straight hair is not worth more than your life. So no, they're going to fail that one. Consumer expectation test. Hold on. <coughs> Sorry. Let's drink some wine. All right. A reasonable consumer would find the product effective when using the product in a reasonable manner. If a reasonable consumer would not find the product to be defective, even when using it in a reasonable manner, the defendant is not liable, even if the product design is flawed. The reasonable manner is I follow the instructions, I put it on my head. It causes problem. So I don't particularly think that they are going to get out of this. The interesting thing about this case, the way it's set up, the only way that they would minimize their liability is to say, this product, actually the utility, because we live in a systemically racist society in this country, because it's a US um, case, we live in a systemically racist society. The utility is that without my hair straightener that ruins these women's lives and kills them, they wouldn't even be allowed to afford anything. And who's gonna argue that? Who's gonna argue that? Nobody, nobody. So importantly, and this is what the plaintiff is claiming, their lawyer, are 
in products are inessential cosmetic products that do not treat or cure any serious disease. Further, safer alternatives, including fragrance-free products, have been readily available for decades. Now I want to know if fragrance is um, a proxy word in all of the products for these things. Also, hair dye is listed in here. So now I need to ask my hairdresser if our hair dye is all right. She seems very above board. I've been using her for years, but just in case. Just in case. Because if not, y'all will see me back to my natural jet black hair expeditiously. All right. Let's go to the next one. So count four is products liability negligent failure to warn. Like, hey, you should have told me that this is not just fragrance. This is phthalate. Do, 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 excerpt, insert all those words that are above my pay grade. Count five, negligence again. Count six, negligence and or gross negligence. You should have known that this was going to cause an issue. Obviously, putting these chemicals that have been banned in other products should also be banned in your product. Count seven, negligent, negligent misrepresentation. So the allocation is defendants had a duty to act accurately and truthfully represent to consumers, plaintiff, and the public that the products have been tested and found to be safe and effective for use. Defendants uh, made representations, which allegedly are false. Obviously, they're not safe. Like, why would you sell a product? And you're like, yeah, it's going to leave a scar for the rest of your life. The scar has been on my, if I got my first perm in the first grade, what are you, six years old? I'm 31. What's that? Is that 25 years? Oh, math is working good today. 25 years, 25 years. The scar hasn't gone away. Um, so then count eight is the same thing, but for Missouri, Missouri Merchandising Practices Act, count nine, val um, violation of Illinois consumer fraud, count 10 in big letters, just straight up fraud, count 11, fraudulent concealment, count 12, breach of express warranty. You have an express warrant. They have an express warranty as the manufacturer of a harmful product to sell you a product that is not harmful. Then you have implied warranties. If you're selling something, you have to have certain warranties in there. Then you have negligent failure to recall. All these years have passed. Many years they could have recalled this product. You're like, you know what? I'm sorry, y'all. We did this and we have made a new um, fragrance-free version. Try this one. We're very sorry. And then count 15 is medical monitoring, which... I vote they find them liable on all 15. So at the end of that very sad, let us read through the comments. Shannon Baker, this is so sad. We need the Crown Act everywhere. These people are so scary. Exactly. We need the Crown Act and we need... I don't think education. We need more repercussions for people that discriminate against natural hair. Because I'm I'm over the idea like, oh, if you teach people about hair, they'll understand. Like, no, no, no. I'm past teaching. You need repercussions. You need consequences. You need consequences because if the discrimination doesn't go away, that is not going to remove the incentive for women to perm their hair. All right. I'm going to go backwards. So if you're just tuning in, scroll to the front. All you're going to see is forehead and comments. I do wonder, Ariel, I do wonder about the hair dyes. I remember my mother hiding her white hair in the sickly sweet smell of the box is branded in my mind. My brother and I led a several years campaign to get her to stop. It said hair dyes as well. So it just blanket said hair dyes. So I wonder if there are safer alternatives. I will be asking um, my hairstylist. I get my hair dyed once a year because, you know, I'm frugal with my money and it's expensive, but I'm definitely about to ask her because nope, ain't no way. Ain't no way. All right, so let's scroll. We'll scroll midway. Okay. Marsha, I will scroll to the beginning. Colonization, the gift that keeps on giving. Listen. <laughs> oh, I hate it. I hate it. Oh. Listen, it's so weird. It's, I hear people touch my hair. Agree. Like, it's just a strange thing to, 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 don't ask people. Don't think it like, don't, no. It's a strange thing to do. Like, unless this is your good friend and you're doing their hair, why would you want to touch a stranger's hair? I find it to be the, the, one of the most gross things. All right. Oh, Lord. I promise myself that the next person that even attempts and I see their hand, I'm going to smack their hand. 
I've told myself this. So ever since I made that promise to myself, no one has done it. So I wonder if I walk around with a certain face on now. <laughs> I wonder if that's like, stopping it. Oh, gosh. All right. Listen. Marsha M, I think the resurgence maybe has to do with people going back to the office more easier to just maintain a perm post pandemic. This is true. I've seen people um, that I follow on Instagram that were natural and like, listen, I got to go back to office. Like, I don't have time. And because we live in a society that people work 60 hours a week, like it's normal, it doesn't afford people the time. So I would say the issues are much more structural than like, you know, individual. <sighs> I hope it's not a trend. I had, I wanted to do, if I had more time, I wanted to see um, there has, I forgot what I was saying at this part, but apparently the natural hair movement is over question, question, like it's a trend. I, cause I, there are an up, a bunch of videos popped up on um, YouTube about how people are like the natural hair movement failed or it didn't fail or this or that. And that reminded me of in the seventies during the black power movement, you see a lot of froze like in the United States, particularly. Um, and that was the style, but then you see a heavy swift into the eighties and it's perm it's creamy crack is on the streets. So I wanted to do, I've done a little bit of reading, but I wanted to do a little more research and to see like what happened when that switch happened and are we experiencing something similar? All right. Yes, so Temi, yes. The resurgence of relaxers is a result in sew-ins, leave-outs, and tape-ins coming back. I see. I see. All right. I'm gonna turn. I'm gonna turn the the AC on, child. It's hot in here. Hi, Yoko. How are you? It's sad when you receive the hair discrimination from your elders that are also black. That I think is like the most hurtful because you're like, but why? Like we're all just gonna suffer together? No, enough. When I went natural, the amount of my family that was like, the amount of my family now that just Stephanie look like a lion. I'm like, well, <laughs> lion it is. <laughs> Get over it. But it's 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 sad sometimes. Some of them are fine with it, and some of them are just like, uh, we we have a lot of work to do. The internalized colonization is rough. Is rough, rough, rough. Oh wow, not the separate store in Canada for um, natural hair products. <laughs> Listen, the messy bun privilege. Listen, I, I wanted, I've never, I'll wear it in the house sometimes. And maybe if I'm running errands, like I've maybe done it twice in my whole life. But it looks like so liberating to be like, oh, I'm just, even that. I'm like, oh, look what happened. <laughs> oh, no. Listen, because they, they don't know. They don't know. Yes, yes, Jada. I feel like people with locks get a lot of that because I love a messy bun in the locks. It looks so it looks so comfortable and calming. But I do have also noticed the disdain that people with locks receive. Um, Jada, as a person with locks who often wears a messy bun, the amount of outright disdain I've received from my family is a slap in the face. It's hurtful. And I wonder, and I know telling them that does nothing. Because I've tried to tell mine and they're like, this is a you problem. If you'd straighten your hair, then I won't have to look at you like this. I'm like, or you could just fix your face. <laughs> you could just fix your face. <laughs> yes, go back to your messy bun. Don't don't let them give you breakage. That's when I stopped. When I realized like in the video, when I was like, man, my hair looks, it was just looking dead. It was flat. It was, it was sad. It was really sad. Thank you, Ema. Oh, this is interesting. Unilever owns Dove, sponsor of Crown Act, and makes relaxer products. Do you think they will be impacted? They are not named in this lawsuit. So that's, that's actually very interesting. 
That's actually very interesting. Very interesting. If you're just tuning in, we're just in comments. Um, so scroll to the front. <laughs> Yes, there are a few. So I'm going to, I will link the complaint. I can't remember where I found it right now because it, it's been sitting there. I was like, oh, I need to read through this. It's about 75 pages. It's a very good read. There are a few studies that link um, fried roids to, um, to perm and they're listed in the complaint. So I will link the complaint afterwards in the description box for y'all. All right. Arte, first degree burns versus third degree burns because it's gentle. The fact that we were getting third degree burns as small children and then either your mom, if your mom was doing it, your aunt, your grandma, or the hairstylist. A hairstylist did my first one and then my mom did all my other ones. It's just like, it's fine. It's supposed to be like that. But I'm like, it's burning. Like my skin, like I, it's, something is wrong. And they're just like, no, 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 just sit there. They're like, I felt it too. And I'm like, so we're all going to get burned. It reminds me of... I think it's all over the Caribbean and probably like in the continent as well. But in Jamaica, everybody over maybe like 35 has a burn mark right here. Maybe 40 um, has a burn mark right here, like a branding. And it's because they didn't keep records at the time for the shots. So they would just, they would just burn people. Colonization has harmed all of us beyond repair. I mean, we can be repaired, but it's awful. It's awful. Listen, okay, I want, I've been wanting to know, did pink lotion work in anyone's hair? And it always was just so sticky. I hated it. Pink lotion, Marissa, pink lotion didn't work on anyone's head, to be honest. It had us in a chokehold anyway. Pink lotion was all, I was like, this is not working. Like nothing, like my hair, I'm coming back home by the end of the day, it's still for, like it's nothing, nothing is being held. Nothing was being held. Cantu, on the other hand, works for me in that Shea Moisture. Honestly, that would be like the one if they came out and they're like, this is I would probably keel over. I'm like, what? I've been using this for 20 years. Um, it is not a class action. And I was hopeful that it was. So I at first I thought it was. So the title did say that and I had to update it. Um, it's not. She herself is suing. But this could easily be a class action. So I'm hoping a lawyer um, branches this out to be a class action because it literally would be outside of the Gen Z, which I'm happy for them, for the young girls, outside of them, I would assume it would probably be almost every black woman almost over 25 in this country. It's wild, it's very wild. Tion, oh, thank you, Ariel. Tion is pronounced Tion in Haiti. This refers to the roll of cloth used to cushion the baskets of the heads of vegetable sellers. Oh, thank you, and I learned something new. Yes. The first time, you know, it was interesting when I was reading the complaint at first, it focuses more on cancer. And all I kept thinking was, is this why we have fibroids? Is this why we have fibroids? So when I got to the section that said fibroids, I was like, I freaking knew it. I knew it. All right. Listen, that's my hair sticking up. <laughs> oh, God. Um, Is the kid version just as bad as the adult version? The studies showed yes. Because the studies started looking at children. What I want to know for those of us that have like gone natural later but we've had years of exposure to relaxer. They haven't started to do those studies. I'm, I'm hoping that they start to do those as well because there's a significant amount of women, I would say, in their 30s that have gone through years of relaxer, have stopped. And does that undo the harm? Is the harm still there? <sighs> All right. I hope so too, Seven. I hope Miss Mitchell's cancer was caught in the first stages. I hope so too. All right. Hey, Hari. You were four to six weeks. Oh, y'all was out here. Okay. They said no new growth. It's, everything is late. Oh, 
was a was very much a tomboy child. So I was like, I just want to run around like a wildly. <laughs> much to the chagrin of my mom, who's very much been a very type of person. <laughs> This is a good point as well. Also, please keep in mind that black women have such a hard time doing their hair, especially if it is 4C. Well, that's why many of them still relax. It's true. There are, they'll, they are factors because, which I would say is due to assimilation. If you're coming from a country, a stolen country, that takes days, like they said in the complaint where um, the Wolof people were like, oh yeah, we have a set time of the week. Everyone is doing each other's hair. This is a common practice. We're not working. And you come into capitalist ass version of America. That's like labor, 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 but only you Negroes doing labor. Where is the time to learn that and to be able to do that? Even now, I'm always like cracking up at the memes of people being like, oh, work from home is great because I'm going to the salon and I'm getting my work done. And I'm like, wow, we're not even giving the time to even be allowed to present the way we want to present in this place. Oh, it's trifling. Agreed. 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 I don't think they cared. I agree. Beauty by Desiree. Maybe they didn't care that it was harming us. I don't think they cared. I don't think they... They didn't care now. It's going to cost them money. But I don't care. All right. Marsha, I wasn't comfortable with my 4C hair until adulthood. I was told it was just easier to perm, but now I know my hair just needs a lot of moisture and patience. I can now detangle in two to three hours. That makes me happy. I think a lot of it is if we are always told something, like, I shouldn't say the person that said it. When I was little, I was like, your hair is rough. Your hair is rough. So then you get the perm. It's like, oh, good. My hair is not rough. Like you said it to me, like so negative. So now I'm like, the hair is rough, whatever. And I'm like, it's not rough. Like it's just curly. Like it's fine. Nobody dies. Like, but it's the way that we talk to each other and that older generations talk to us about our hair. So all wrapped into how older generations talk to them about their hair, all wrapped into, oh, well, I used to get they people, unfortunately, um, our ancestors used to get beaten if they were running around looking a certain way. Hmm. All right, so let's go through the most recent comments and I'll let y'all go since we're a little over and I have to pack my clothes. <laughs> All right. Oh, I wonder. I wonder if that could be said for products like Jerry Curls, probably the same stuff. What was the effort in that? I wasn't alive at that point. I wasn't alive at that point. Tashana, the ingredients in the kid relaxers is exactly the same as the adult ones. Literally just put on a kid's, literally just put a kid's face on a product box. Exactly. Mm -hmm. A kid's face that don't have no perm in her head. <laughs> just lying to all of us. Lying to all of us. A lot of internalized anti-blackness for sure. Exactly. We, we have it because it's passed down to us and the society reinforces it. So, but again, I don't think the issue is telling people, love yourself. It's like, no, you to fix society. If I love me more than, you know, the earth and the sun and the moon, it doesn't matter if people treat me like crap. So... This is a great question, Misha. How to heal from that mentality that is so ingrained? Listen, therapy, therapy, to be honest. Oh, Samuel's review. These comments are amazing. Wish I could like um, them. It makes me very happy too. I'm happy. We're gonna read, we're gonna read more of these and then, you know, I'll leave. I'll, I'll let y'all go eat dinner. Mar Mara Cherise, speak positively about your hair and the way you feel about it changes. My mom used to call my hair wild. Yep, that that's the word. Wild and rough. That's what I used to get every day and stopped after I confronted her about it. I'm glad she did. My mom still says it to me. <laughs> but now it's a game. But that's because I'm an antagonistic Aries. So whenever I FaceTime her, I make sure it's really big. I make sure it's really big. I'm like, if you're going to do this, we're going to do this. <laughs> Uh, 
um, Jack King, hopefully all the natural ones pass down the healthy habits. I hope so. I, I don't think, I think the natural hair movement for me as somebody who went natural, seventh grade is shit in the early, in the late aughts, I think I was seven or the seventh grade. I kind of, child, you don't know math for me. In like 2002, 2003 ish. You guys are high school in 09. Nobody, in particular, Miami is very anti-black. Nobody was natural. And it was one of those things where it was just awkward, but I just, I was tired of the freaking burns in my head. I was like, no, that shit hurts. Like, I just don't want it. Um, like, I didn't have any sense to be like, oh, it's bad for me, blah, blah. I was like, I just literally don't, I can't sit there anymore. And it was so nice for me as somebody who had been natural for a while to see the natural hair movement. I was like, oh, this is nice. I'm not by myself. And to learn things because when I went natural, I didn't know what I was supposed to put in my head. I live with my dad. Like my dad is bald. He doesn't know anything about hair. It was a lot of trial and error and mostly error. Lots of gel. Lots of gel. It looked, it looked Jerry Curl-esque. It was very stiff. It was giving just stiff all over. It was interesting. So the natural hair movement made me happy to see more people. Um, and I learned a lot of things. So. I learned about this great brush that goes through my 4A, 4B hair so nicely when I'm combing the conditioner through it. Ooh, what's the brush? I need one of, I'm still using a wide tooth comb. And every time I tell my hairstylist, she just looks at me. She's like, Stephanie, please stop. And I'm like, what? And she's like, you need to buy this brush. And I keep forgetting to do it. Yes, agreed, Amy, agreed. And I think ending the cycle of texturism, we'd have to end the systemic oppression of certain textures. That's the only way it would end is more external than it is internal. I think internal, of course, like you have to do um, the self-love is a small part compared to the external part is very large. Kelly P. I stopped relaxing in my early 20s. Haven't looked back since. All right. Yes, when I started tr trimming my hair, as you can see in that other video, I never cut my I was like, the length. I need the length. That hair was gone. That hair was dead. Like, when I got my first cut, this is the only hairstyles I ever let cut my hair. She cut off, like, six inches of my hair. And I almost cried. I was like, oh. and she's like, Stephanie, it's, it's, it's no resuscitating this. And then it was so much easier to comb it out. I was like, oh, okay. All right. Okay, I'm like, I'm like, I'm determined to get to the bottom. Oh, we'll go on my gal. Yes. Come on, Jamaican Aries. Okay, I thought we were to the bottom. I'm like, I'm determined to get to the bottom and then let y'all go. Oh, thank you. The brush is called the Denman brush. Okay, I'm gonna look that up. Look up the Denman brush. They're evil. <laughs> someone said they hate it. Someone said they love it. Well, <laughs> either you're going to hate it or you're going to love it. We're about to see. <laughs> That's why I keep with my wide tooth comb. I'm like, the wide tooth comb hasn't failed me. Hasn't failed me in 20 years. Yeah. It, okay. Is this the natural hair movement has been taken over by the type three curlies. The new natural hair movement is um, micro locks or traditional locks. It's true. The three, the three C curlies went in there and just bamboozled people. And we're like, oh, yeah. It's these three products and this and that and the next. And I was like, girl, that's a wash and go. I remember I watched a few videos as somebody who has literally been using the same products for 20 years because I didn't have anybody teach me. And once I found a product that worked, I was like, yeah, no, I'm not using anything else. So every once in a while I would watch it and I'm like, that's a wash and go. I was like, this looks like my hair. I was like, you're lying. <laughs> you're lying. This is not correct. I tried a twist out once. I was like, oh, I'm going to try this twist out. This looks great. It looked nothing like it. And I was like, yeah, that's because there's 3C hair. This doesn't look like this is not... <laughs> This is bamboozlement. This is bamboozlement. But listen. All right. Oh, no. Okay. So listen, Denman is going to work for some and not work for some. And I think that's what I've realized about natural hair in general. Well, it works for certain people. It doesn't work for everyone, which is why every once in a while, like new people will come on the channel and they'll be like, can you do a hair tutorial? I'm like, absolutely not. I'm like, I'm not going to bamboozle people. Like, mm -mm. I like it's farce. It's farce. <laughs> Listen, exact. Listen, the girl, the girls was not telling the truth. The girls was not telling the truth. 
Uh oh, listen. Okay, so now we have another brush, Felicia Underwood brush as well. So there's some for Denman, some for Felicia Underwood, and then two. I just point the hair products are not one size fits all for sure. Exactly. I need to try some because I'm tired of my stylist side eyeing me the once a year I go in there. And also the wide tooth comb, I know it's not the most efficient. I know it's not. So I need to, I need to do that. All right, y'all. And Tracy edited videos. Listen, <laughs> I'm glad we've all, oh, Felicia Leatherwood. Okay, for the brush. I'm glad we've all come to the realization that a scheme was occurring. A scheme was occurring. They should be ashamed. Some of them should really apologize. I don't think they will, but they should really apologize. Listen, just like that, why tooth comb? Why tooth comb has never failed. It doesn't break. The most, one of the most painful things when I was like first going natural was when a comb would break in my hair. And I was like, oh, I was like the horror, the horror of it. Then I found me a wide tooth comb. I was like, oh, this is great. This is great. Okay. Felicia Leatherwood does Issa Rae's hair. Oh, and her hair always looks great. Okay. The Denman is a must. See, I see y'all are, y'all are with the Denman or the Felicia. Okay. I'm going to try, I'm going to try both. Why not? I'm going to try both and see. But the wide tooth comb is going to stay in my bathroom because <laughs> I know it works. I know it works. Listen, wide tooth plastic comb, it's a great thing. It's a great thing. And it's cheap and it's everywhere. If you forget your comb when you're out on vacation, all of a sudden you need to comb your hair out. She, she's always there. She's a staple. She's sturdy. She's reliable. But I'm, I'm going to try some of these new age things. I'm going to try it. All right. Well, on that note, I'm going to finally let you all go um, and eat your dinner and have a lovely weekend. I have some videos. I'm supposed to film another video, but I need to pack. Um, probably I want to try put the student loan video out by Friday. We'll see. I see my sister is in here. Hello, sister. Um, we'll see if she lets me do that. You know, teenagers are rambunctious. So we'll see if I get any filming done while I'm home, but hopefully we can and then we'll have some more videos. So I appreciate y'all and you know, let us hope and let us work towards getting the Crown Act passed everywhere. And then also putting some repercussions to actions when people actually discriminate based on hair texture, because that's the only way to change the structure of the issue in this place. And this place largely runs on money. So, you know, some lawsuits, some more lawsuits against these um, relaxer companies, against these large corporations that discriminate against people based on their hair and their hair texture. So... All right. I appreciate y'all. You have a wonderful evening and I will see y'all hopefully later in the week. Bye.